I'm particularly excited about tonight's conversation partners, Ed Bach Lee and Kevin Yang. We recently published an anthology with the University of Minnesota Press, We Are Meant to Rise, Voices for Justice from Minneapolis to the World, which features 33 BIPOC writers, including tonight's speakers. Writers grappling with the events of the last two years, the pandemic and the murder of George Floyd and its aftermath. There are also essays and poems about loss, family, food, culture, economic security, mental health, and other issues. So for more information about what we're doing and when, uh, please look at our, uh, our newsletter and uh, visit our website. And when I first read a draft of Kevin Yang's essay for our book, I was deeply moved when reading about his admiration for Ed Bach Lee, whose work had a huge impact on his own writing journey. I hoped to get these two men together in a public conversation. So when Kia Vang suggested this new program, it was for me a no brainer to kick it off with Kevin Yang and Ed Bach Lee. So let me introduce the two of them and then I'll tell you how, the, how it's going to work. Ed Bach Lee is the author of three books of poetry which have received the American Book Award, Asian American Literary Award, Minnesota Book Award, and Penn Open Book Award. He is also the, also the co-translator of Smiling in an Old Photograph, poems by Kim, I'm sorry, Ed, I can't pronounce the name, but it's recently published just this year. Um, and he's a part-time faculty at Metro State University. And Kevin Yang is a Hmong American multidisciplinary artist with a focus on spoken word poetry and documentary filmmaking. He currently works at Twin Cities PBS and is a board member with Street Stops and Mountain Tops. He finds most of his artistic inspiration unraveling his Hmong American experience with others. So here's how it's gonna work. Um, Kevin is going to begin the program by reading one of his poems and then Ed will ask him a question or two and then they'll reverse it. Ed will read a poem and Kevin will ask a question or two and then they'll probably just have a free flowing conversation between the two of them before we open it up for audience participation. So please welcome Ed Bach Lee and Kevin Yang. Sounds good, thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, first of all, I wanna say thank you to everybody. Thank you to Carolyn um, for this wonderful program um, and the chance to, 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 to share um, in the anthology. Um, thank you to Ed, um, as, as Carolyn described, um, uh, your writings had a huge impact on my life and where I'm at right now. So just really blessed to be having this conversation with you tonight. Um, thank you to everyone at Heaven County Library. Thank you to Kia. And thank you to everyone who's watching um, this conversation go down. So as Carolyn shared, um, I'll be sh starting the night by reading a, a, a poem. Um, and then we'll take the conversation from there. And this poem is called uh, Notes on Plants. One, for the past few summers, I've been trying my best to grow vegetables, a practice that I've always envied of my mother. Each winter has been a ritual, flimsy Dixie cups filled to the brim with black dirt, seeds sprinkled over the tops and waiting, many weeks of patiently waiting for the Minnesota earth to thaw. One year it was eggplants, wanting nothing more than to hold the fleshy fruit in my palms only to watch the seedlings crushed underneath hail in April. Another year it was beets, the joy of plucking each pink nugget from the brown earth only to realize that I had no idea how to eat a beet. So I watched them rot on the kitchen counter, happy enough to remember it once started out as a seed. Two, when we first moved into our house, dirt and weeds were the only things sitting between back door and sidewalk. For weeks, we unraveled rolls of sod hoping to make our backyard fit into the quiet suburban neighborhood around us. The only difference about ours was a massive patch of untouched dirt right in the center of it all. From it, my parents planted a garden full of cucumbers, full of chili peppers, full of life. Ask my mother what her favorite part of her house is and she will most likely point you towards her garden. Three, I've been learning about secondary forests, a phenomenon in which a new canopy of trees grows out from the decay of the old growth forest beneath it because of drought or disease or disaster. The easiest way to find them is the clear break in the tree line. A tall row of maple is only to be punctuated by a line of white birches beneath them that seem out of place. I can't help but see the different trees in my family, Minnesota and Laos, 
the break in the canopy like birch and maple, somewhere between peace and war, between gunshots on the Mekong River and a warm bed in Minneapolis. How does nature transition so softly from old growth to soft pine? Four, there is a Hmong folk tale that after surviving a flood that destroyed the rest of the world, brother and sister give birth to their first child, a grotesque being resembling pumpkin more than human. In their shock, they chop up their creation and spread its remains across the earth where each piece landed a Hmong clan was born. Sometimes I stare at maps and remember this folk tale run my finger across the countries, what being sacrificed itself to allow us to be reborn again after this flood we called war. Our people scattered into the wind like seeds catching root on every corner of the earth, yet recognizing our common roots. One time in Thailand, a monk kid tells me that he too is a huge fan of BTS. And in this moment, I cannot help but believe that we were all cut from the same pumpkin. Five, this year I've been trying to grow snow peas watching each shoot a step up towards the sky too heavy for its own body. Somehow each tendril reaches out towards the other, creating a canopy where they can all stand. Four stems sprouting from four different cups, no words exchanged, no special scaffolding needed, all aware of how to keep each other standing, of how to keep each other growing. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that poem, Kevin. And thank you, Carolyn and Nia and everyone for organizing this kind of talk. Um, I've never heard you read that poem and I just read it for the first time, you know, very recently. And I have some questions. Um, first of all, I love that line. I cannot help but believe that we were all cut from that same pumpkin. It's interesting because I, I read my daughter, uh, a Korean fairy tale called General Pumpkin. And it's about, very briefly, it's about a, a son of um, an only child and he loves pumpkins and his parents try to do everything for him and to, to, to give him all the pumpkins he wants. And that's all he eats, pumpkin porridge, pumpkin pie, cooked pumpkins, pumpkin soup. And he has massive flatulence. <laughs> um, he farts a lot. And so he grows up eating pumpkin and only pumpkin. And, you know, his parents, they can't take it anymore. And the, and the villagers can't take it. And so um, one day in a, in a nearby uh, monastery, um, these monks decide, because they're, they they've, are the targets for bandits, they decide to get general, he's not general pumpkin yet. He's still a young man. They get him to stay there. And to make a long story short, they give him all the pumpkins he can eat, eat and he, he wards off all the bandits. And so one night, Zhang, who's like the bandit of bandits, comes with his gang and um, starts raiding, you know, the coffers of, of the monastery. And General Pumpkin wakes up and he goes to work. And like the, <laughs> um, Zhang ends up dying because of the flatulence. And in the end, he stays. General Pump he becomes General Pumpkin and he stays in the monastery and he protects and he wards off all evil things with his flatulence. Anyway, um, what a noble death. <laughs> so pumpkins, I just you know pumpkins. There's something kind of ridiculous and mythic and 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 um, powerful about pumpkins. Um, getting to like gardening so the the poem is about gardening like do you see any any notable parallels since you've started gardening in the last few years between writing poetry or creating art and gardening for sure most definitely i think um i've been writing about my mother a lot um i think about the different practices that mother always did when I was younger and things that she shared with me. And I think I'm being inspired a lot about that lately. Um, when everything about that poem, I, I just immediately think of my mother. Um, and I think gardening is a practice that um, she will just love so much and try to share with try to share with us. So I think that's a parallel that I, I, I find with my poetry, um, sort of like excavating, digging up these different pieces of stories um, that my mother shared with me. Um, and just finding so much strength and remembering that history and 
almost reinterpreting it as an adult now. I um, mean, it's even fascinating listening to you talk about that pumpkin story and you reading it to your daughter. Um, is that story like rooted in like, a, a, is that like a common story or is like, was it just something that someone wrote down? Because I'm like, I love these little like, these little ridiculous stories that I think, I think they, I, I often find myself like gravitating towards them and then like telling these stories within stories, especially in my poetry um, and then trying to like create entire worlds around them. But what, 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 do you know what the source of that story was? Because I find that I, I don't. <laughs> I just have a Korean book of fairy tales that I actually got in Korea and um, that story, General Pumpkin, and she loves it. Of course she loves it. She's five. Well, she just turned six recently. Um, <laughs> yeah okay so my my second question um i've personally been thinking about hope a lot lately and i don't know anyone who probably hasn't but especially those who create and make art and write um but i can't imagine anyone in the last few years hasn't been struggling with hope right um and kind of thinking about the flip side of hope as you know, I guess despair is one of the flip sides. I think it has many flip sides. Another is, um, you know, when you lose hope, when you have hope and then lose it, I think it can turn into hatred. Um, and I think that's somehow linked to make America great again. Mm -hmm. And the hate that we see from a lot of those people who, who subscribe to that ideology. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about um, hope and gardening. So, you know, there's this idea of hope as some kind of like um, almost Pollyannish that in this way that like, if you have hope, things will be all right. And if you lose hope, you're lost. And to me, thinking about hope a lot, it's like gardening. Um, you do the work, you do the labor, and then you hope, you know, that your broccoli will turn out and it may not, but you've planted other vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. And you do all it's, it's, it's not that you don't do all you can. Um, even if, you know, there's an early frost, you, you do all you can and you hope things will turn out, but they may not. And you're also, aware of that and you have a kind of contingency plan maybe um but you don't stop hoping mm -hmm. and it and your hope is um dependent on your labor because if you don't do the labor if you don't do the work and the preparation and the caregiving and the nurturing you can hope but it's not going to turn it's just not going to turn out right mm -hmm. um and so thinking about like culture building and the future and capitalism and all these things society um, and how gardening is such a good metaphor for that. Um, this all leads to a question that I wrote down in some very unintelligible script here. Um, yeah, where, where are you right now with hope as a, as a human being, as a creator? Sure, that's a great question. Um, I think I'm finding a lot of a hope in folks who are finding ways to connect and play in this moment of like disconnection of not being able to be with each other, um, because of the pandemic and everything else happening in the world around us. Um, people who are able to find meaning and doing things like uh, creative zoom meetings, even. Uh, but just folks who are able to build these connections and, and keep these connections alive during times like these. Um, finding a lot of hope in like other living beings. Um, I got two dogs um, the past two years and it's been a really, really big two years. I, I, I got married, bought a house with my partner. Um, I think being able to build that foundation and, and, and with, 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 with all of that um, has been really, really important and continuing to find ways to, to like build um, to, to plant those seeds and to, to to watch them grow even if they don't always grow like that broccoli um but the process of it all continuing to learn too um i think i've been finding a lot of hope in that process yeah right on um 
this may come up. I just recently bought a house too. And, you know, we're, you know, the garden have, have we haven't, have you started yet? Have you? No, we haven't. Um, we haven't started yet just because things have been so unpredictable. Um, I know we're supposed to even just start doing ceilings and things like that, but um, it's almost like we're trying to get everything ready and trying to figure everything else out around us that uh, it's been difficult to just sit down and put things into a milk carton. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm right now looking out at this, like, it's just weeds um, or clover, whatever, but I'm going to have to do a lot of work um, very soon. So I have a poem about, it's not about gardening, but it's about plants. And it was written when my um, daughter was two years old and when we lived in Powderhorn and she loved to walk around and, and loved violets for some reason. So this is called Baby Girl Learns to Take a Trip Around Venus. You could say flowers plant humans in the middle of their sometimes flamboyant, mostly tranquil lives. Take these violets we stroll past each day along the sidewalk, leaves scalloped, sepals half concealed like they know what is coming. See how our baby girl greets each face to face, nose bobbing, tongue tip hovering over the anthers like a bee. She doesn't care this diminutive flower contains hydrocarbonic terpenes to temporarily desensitize her olfactory receptors. Does not know one spring not a mile away as violets bloomed among family of four from Frogtown, bought the house behind my landlords. And the next week I overheard two white neighbors mumbling like dandelions, more would come because you know how the Hmong breed like weeds. Not a word of the apartment complex down the way, mostly black to service that nearby factories grinding gears of history or the boarding house a block south, it's men with secret shifts surrounding all the taquerias up and down Lake Street or the little earth Native American housing projects four blocks north of the Pioneer and Soldiers Memorial Cemetery and nothing of the Scandinavians and other Europeans, all the mice, hemlock and smallpox stowed away on their ships. All baby girl understands is violets taste like vanilla and wintergreen. And if she holds my hand, we can cross the street to visit the empty seed pods, wild plantain and clover. And when we cross back home, she needs to greet her best purple blue friends all over again. You could say their spirits were always here, that this common flirtatious flower adored by Napoleon and used by Venus to batter and bruise prettier goddesses furtively fans its admirers. But it only be half true. Take the African violets on our porch, AKA St. Paulius after Baron Walter von St. Paul, a middling colonial administrator who in 1892 discovered the flowering blue wild on a rocky ledge in the Usambara mountains of Tanzania, therein initiating their mass cultivation to the West. Maybe all flowers have an imperializing function if not to cover up the stench, to beautify all the graves. Part Korean, Irish, Ukrainian, French, German, and Jew. Oh, baby girl, I want to believe your future is an open field of glorious weeds and wildflowers, not a legacy of granite statues, strip malls, and parking ramps. You're only two years old with not 15 world-soaked words, but someday, when you can stay up late enough to gaze at the moon. Instead, I'll take you on a long walk through our Milky Way. I'll advise ignoring all the human categories, Kuiper Belt, Cygnus Constellation, Fornax Cluster. Look, I'll say, listen to that far bouquet of stars, its pulsating hues like a copse of scintillating aspens in autumn. 
I'll insist in this infinite universe. No one cares. Where are you from? What are you? It may not be true, but I'll say it anyway. Far in your future, all will recognize a human being when they encounter one. And if they don't, as with violets, red maples, stinging nettles, even Jupiter's loneliest moon, you will still know what to do. Thank you for sharing it. That's such a beautiful poem um, on so many levels. Um, I think I'm constantly um, fascinated by the concept of place, especially when it shows up in poetry. Um, I think a big part of it is as, as a person who's Hmong and um, our unique relationship with place and homeland and of how, um, how amorphous that's been. So I found it really some of my favorite parts of this poem where you when you were listing different places. Uh, I grew up in South Minneapolis too, but um, that leads me to my question is, especially in a poem like this, but um, how do you find yourself being, um, your, your work being informed by, by location and place and how did place influence the creation of this poem? Yeah, so the poem was written when we were living in Powderhorn, um, but it also, you know, Powderhorn um, is right next to another neighborhood in South Minneapolis, Corcoran. And so this, where I also, where I lived for 10 years before that. And um, so it takes place partly in Corcoran and Lake Street and then Powderhorn. Um, and that place, you know, that just, that, that area, it's, it's not a coincidence that, I mean, it, it, we can't help but not talk about like the murder of George Floyd, which happened, you know, six blocks away from where we lived in Powderhorn. Um, and, you know, the, the, the precinct, the police precinct that was burned um, in the aftermath of that um, is also right very close to many of these places that I reference, like the Pioneer and Soldier Cemetery, where there are, you know, I've been told there are um, graves dating back to the Indian Wars and Spanish-American Civil War, but, and also that there are, um, according to the Minnesota Historical Society, um, perhaps hundreds of African-American soldiers' graves from the Civil War. And then you have this Native American housing project, you know, a stone's throw away. And then you have the third precinct and, 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 all, and, you know, that target there, you know, and that all this, the shops around there were, were um, looted in the aftermath and burned um, and destroyed. And something about that mix of histories of people's histories and wars in America coming together and just like in a powder keg ex exploding seems to me right in the heart of the country, in the middle of America, like literally right, right near the Mississippi River, right? Um, this mythic river that, you know, runs through America and is symbolic for so much. And I think that it's just, it's just resonating um, in the air, like the tensions and also the beauty, like you have a lot of people from many different backgrounds living together, like all the people I reference and, and many histories. Um, so there's this tension and this beauty. It's like, all, it's like the beauty of America. And then it's also like the, the dark side of America all at once. And I, I, it's hard to think um, it's hard to quantify like how that how place affected me, but I was just just walking around, you know, experiencing. I think the last thing I'll say is, you know, poetry for me is is largely about presence, like being present. And to be present, you you're aware of your surroundings, right? Um, not just geographical, but time and place in which you exist. And how can you not? be responding and how can not 
how can all the things political cultural um horticultural things enter into your being and then through the medium of poetry enter onto the page for sure absolutely that's that's powerful um another question i had and i think this is it's it's beautiful the pairing of our, our, our two poems and the connections to, to to plants um um thinking through um just just reading this um and hearing you you, you read it this connection between all these different pieces in the universe um it's kind of an abstract question but um what do you what do you learn from plants um what is this this this, this concept of connection between all these different things how does it how does it come up and what, what, what were you trying to say with that I found that really, really powerful. Well, this is, that's a great question. Um, first of all, in one, if you think about plants, like in many ways, they're superior to human beings, maybe in every way, right? Um, they, they live, die, they procreate um, without all the drama very few if any plants like create toxic um you know garbage that is you know detrimental to other other um beings of course there are plants that are poisonous but it's for self-preservation right i don't think plastic is self-preservation on the part of humans um or guns i mean i guess in some scenarios but um if you if you just if if the um, power and the beauty of a living creature, if you, is to live, I mean, be born to live, to in symbiotically interact with the, the place where it exists and make it better. Um, you know, these are all human terms. I can't help but, you know, talk through human frameworks, which are all messed up, right? Um, and very human centric. So I'm sorry. Um, but plants just, you know, they, they, I'm not trying also to make them more noble than, you know, or to anthropomorphize them. I'm trying to do that as, as little as I can because I don't think they give a shit, right? They're just existing the way they've existed for eons with with variations um and evolving and with very little drama and um destruction and they just make everything habitable for the rest of us from insects to, to other animals to mammals uh and so then when you say when and then of course we look at them as some kind of inferior being um when you when when you think of like what life form is superior uh <laughs> i have my ideas but it doesn't seem that humans um can compete in terms again see that's that's a poor word choice or poor concept maybe I mean, I can go on and on because plants do compete with one another. I'm not trying to, like I said, I'm not trying to um, make them out as like these noble things, but life form, successful life forms, they're very successful. If you, if you just break it down to procreation and regeneration through generations, they're very successful. Um, I forgot your question. What was? Yeah, it was it, it was it's very much that they're sort of asking you um, what can we learn from plants, but rather a larger question of why why were you pulled? Why were you inspired? Uh, or how were you inspired by uh, plants in, in the creation of, of, of your of your work? But this poem specifically, and I found that your response really really touching. Well, you know again briefly, um, not again briefly, but this time briefly, my daughter was just entranced by violets and would talk to them. You know, she as an only child, she didn't have 
many words or or friends that she could communicate with, but for some reason she felt she could communicate with plants. And we know that they're sentient on 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 some level that maybe humans um, in our hierarchy maybe put on a lower scale, but um, she just loved them and still does. She knows more. I should say that her mother is a beekeeper, um, like a professional beekeeper. And so she just knows more names and types of plants. So I'll, we'll be walking around now and she's only six. I'll ask her, what is that? Now she's getting into trees and she can tell me what kind of trees. And it's just sort of that lexicon and that way of looking at the world, I think um, was something that she just um, was drawn to that, the, that kingdom um, very early on. And I could not help but respond to that in writing. Absolutely. And I think hearing this, I could feel the magic of that. Huh? Maybe magic's not even the right word, but the, the process of that. It's beautiful. Thank you, Ed. Um, I can read my next poem. Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. Uh, my next poem is called Cups and Courts, and it's actually dedicated to my grandmother um, who passed away recently um, during the pandemic. Um, I'm thinking a lot about... Um, talked about earlier about how I'm often inspired by my mother, I'm also very inspired by my grandmother, and she's a person who shows up often in my poetry. Um, but this is a poem dedicated to her. Excuse my dog in the background. Today is my grandmother's birthday. Or at least I think it is. I asked mom if today is my grandmother's birthday. She tells me that we are celebrating it because dad has work off. I asked mom how old is grandmother and she replies simply that grandmother is old. We are all standing in my aunt's kitchen. Trays of vanilla wafers and bananas sit on tabletops. Egg rolls being folded at a frantic pace. Dora the Explorer blaring the background. Four generations of hands finding themselves busy and one birthday cake covered in thick plastic. I asked my mother how how many candles I should prepare, and then in walks my grandmother. My grandmother sees the world in ways that I'm still trying to comprehend. She measures the world in approximates, in pinches of salt, in handfuls of strawberries, and bok choy hearts torn at the fingertips. She has never owned a calendar. I've never found a measuring cup inside of her kitchen cabinets. Ask my grandmother how thin the bamboo should, should be cut, and she will tell you, you you have to cut it as thin as a pinky finger. Now her hands and my hands share little resemblance in size or callus, but when she tells me to cut the bamboo as thin as a pinky finger, my knife knows exactly where it needs to be. See, measurements can be confusing. For example, we were told that we were going to start eating at two and it's 3.30 and we're still cooking and we're hungry, but we're patient. For example, I've learned that the light year is not a measurement of time. It is a measurement of distance of the number of meters traveled by a single photon of light in one Julian year, that it is easy to confuse distance with time and time with distance. 1979, the first time grandmother arrives in this country, 7,929, the number of miles between San Francisco and Bangkok International Airport, 5.4, the number of inches between a thumb and pointer finger on a twirling globe, 89 cents, the cost of the first ice cream sundae ever eaten, eight pounds, now nine ounces, the weight of a grandson sitting in her daughter's stomach. And how foolish of me to believe that a handful of seconds could do justice to every cup, to every court, to believe that I could ever measure a life in just years. Mom removes the plastic from the cake, places a single candle at the very center, ignites the wick with match. We all sing, we all clap. Grandmother sits quietly, stares into the candle, into the single flame melting wax. She breathes in and exhales. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, hearing it is even more powerful than reading it. Um, it seems to me this poem is about generations. You know, you mentioned your parents and your grandmother <clears throat> and uh, you, you write about family a lot, I know. And my question to you is when you're, when you're writing about family, 
um, what, and it may not be conscious, but what, what are you going for? Like, um, yeah, for sure. Um, is it to hey. preserve? Is it, is it to celebrate? Is it, yeah, is there, I mean, I'm, it's probably more than one thing. Definitely. Yeah. It's a lot. Um, I think a lot of it is, 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 is like you said, it's, it's generation thinking about my specific place in time. Um, sort of not the story of, of, of my mother and grandmother of folks who survived a war, but surviving a different kind of, 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 of context in the United States of America as a second generation immigrant. And I think whenever I write about my family and what I do a lot of my poetry is sort of marking my place in time and understanding my history. Um, and it's a lot of these different images, a lot of these artifacts um, that pop up. It'll be things like um, family gatherings or, 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 or rituals um, and, and among folks like when, when we do owning, like when we come together, um, religious practices and things like that, where all of our family gathered together and as young people, or as a young person, it's just sort of like this thing that we did when we were young, like sort of moments in which we all gathered in our van and got the chance to meet all of our cousins. Um, um, and that was the only time we really saw each other. Um, but I think when I when I draw on these artifacts in my in my memory, it's 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 a reminder of where I was in that part of, of, of my life and and in and, and our place in this generation. So um, I feel like that's what I'm always coming to. I think poetry for me, a big part of it um, has been being able to document that history. And I think that's why I've been drawn a lot to documentary filmmaking too, is just figuring out these uh, these in-between spots, these stories that are often forgotten, but that make so much sense to certain people and, and bringing, breathing life into them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, what I also wanted to say is I, I really love how you weave in history through family into the poems. Um, and yeah, do you see yourself in any way um, as a historian in any sense of the word? Yeah, I feel like that's definitely one of the goals of whenever I write. Um, I think, especially as a Hmong person, um, as an artist, I think, um, I'm really drawn by the history of, of, of our people about how we used art as a way of history keeping um, um, and our textiles and, and, and the stories, our, our origin stories. I think art has always been a way for us to pass down um, our places in history from one generation to the next. And even if I don't practice it the same way that my ancestors did, I think I find a lot of strength in, um, in that practice. Um, because I find myself coming back time and time again and, and to, 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 to these types of stories that I want to tell. Um, so I definitely, I definitely love the concept of being like an artist who documents history. Yeah. What, what kind of documentaries as a filmmaker um, are you working on? For sure. I'm very, I'm very fascinated by these in-between generations. Um, as I said earlier, um, I'm a second generation Hmong person. So um, I really love the concept of folks who are able to create third spaces um, or, or to tell stories of third spaces. So um, I think a lot about what it meant to be a Hmong person who um, was in between what felt like two different worlds of sort of my American identity and my Hmong identity and making sense of that. Um, I often tell the story of how I often grew up eating hot dogs and rice for breakfast together and about just these fun little moments that um, that make sense for folks who existed in that third space. Um, so I'm really, really interested in that. Um, one documentary that I'm, 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 I want to learn, well, I'm in the process of, of, of trying to, to bring to life is a story about the first Hmong Boy Scouts troop in Minnesota. And my father was one of the first Hmong Boy Scouts, but just this concept of uh, once again, the Boy Scouts being this exemplar of what we believe the um, like American man should be. Um, and then also like um, finding a place where you can build community of other Hmong folks, right? Especially for folks of my father's generation um, and that being in the same place and, and making meaning of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> There aren't a lot of spaces, you know, we've both done a lot of readings where it's 
you know, two Asian American men talking about whatever poetry um, or anything really. Uh, that's interesting what you said about your father being the first um, first Hmong American Boy Scout. Did I hear that right? Yeah, he was he was he's he was part of he was part of one of the first troops. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's cool. And just like how to be a man in America, um, especially when I guess in the context of um, you know your father and anyone who looks like him, which is both of us probably to a certain extent, um, when the men in your family are also the enemy of America and have been in multiple wars and this and, and that 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 sense is primal within uh, um non-asian americans you know maybe they they were in vietnam maybe they were in korea maybe you know it and i i wouldn't just say maybe it's it's i wouldn't say it's primal only to you know white men uh, many people have have these you know it's a, like a collective unconscious thing right when you think of the enemy it's it's changed and it's morphed but it's always a brown well first black you know native male body and then asian males and brown males sort of got rolled into that mix in terms of like this collective unconscious enemy that america um has in its psyche and i don't know where this question is going but um wait am i asking a question or, yeah. or am i <laughs> or am i reading oh you're 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 asking a question but, okay um, yeah okay yeah about um about the last poem you wrote, right? Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, it's funny because while your while your dogs are barking, which I loved, and they're only they only barked. Note while you started talking and reading about your grandmother, my daughter and mother, who's visiting, are very close in the next room talking uh, fairly loudly. So I'm, I'm listening to <laughs> with half half with one ear to what's going on there and. Um, my daughter trying to get into the room. That's why I locked the door. I have to do that nowadays. <laughs> but um, so there's just a lot, a lot of, a lot of things going on. Um, so forgive me for being a little, uh, a little confused in terms of that poem. You also have poems I know about community, right? Um, beyond the Hmong. I know you've stated before that you're one of your missions is to like give full canvas to the stories in the Hmong American experience and especially this, you know, third place, second people in between. And I feel like that too. I identify with that as being second generation Korean American, um, knowing some Korean, but not enough often, um, but more than maybe some like Korean American friends who were born here and don't speak a word except for food terms. and. And it's kind of weird, you know, when I go back, I know you were back in Thailand in the refugee camps, I'm assuming. I got a chance to actually visit some of the Hmong villages up there. Um, so it wasn't necessarily the, the refugee camps, but I got a chance to connect with a lot of Hmong folks, which is transformational experience. For Getting sure. a chance to yeah meet my my people to put it any other way half, halfway across the world. And were you able to communicate with them? Yeah, it was sort of like a watershed moment where I, I obviously didn't speak a lot of Thai and they didn't speak a lot of English. But um, as I said earlier here, I was thousands of miles away from, from home and um, communicating and, and sharing in, in ways that were, were life changing. Yeah. Yeah, I have that experience, something similar when I, you know, actually every time, not just the first time I went back. Um, since I was six years old, then then many years passed, and then I went back, um, and I had lost so much of the language, almost all of it, and I had to relearn it. But just sort of being in that space, 
that you know what you're terming a third space um where you're not one thing you, you're you're you know you you put it pretty eloquently like what is that space if you have some language and i think it it is often very language dependent like it, like it, if you know some of the language and some of the cultures and you have an intuitive sense of that but then it's limited but then you you know more so, something beyond like that was encoded in you by english only so it is an interest and that's how actually how i got into translation um to try to make something useful out of that confused confusing space all right i, I see we have three minutes this is a, a sh I'll, my second poem is um called water in love and it's just a minute and a half how to love like water loves when it's impossible to even taste all the ghostly sediments each time you take a sip impossible to savor the salt in your blood the light and island shorelines in each living cell when even the plainest mouthful tastes more of you than you of it sweetest of absences that freeze in wave after wave debris of thought like the dead the drowned the vanished and yet sails your lips on a voyage toward another's plying all luck and regret worship splash guzzle or forget it clears any difference stone washer and mountain dissolver that will outlive us even the memory of all any eyes touched wasp and cactus in a desert comet through outer space sleep among all the cloud shepherds children a love so perpetually current it doesn't care that you love without even knowing you love what you couldn't survive three days without how to love like that wild dream sparkler and inmost virtuoso of every snowflake wise ebullient and generous as the rain deepest of miracles for a time borrowing and replenishing a self overflowing awake thank you for sharing that Ed. i just uh, i just love all the different forms um and the way you transverse between different forms i think that's so powerful and it sort of speaks to the ever-changing form i love that so much i would like to break in here and oh my gosh what an interesting and beautiful conversation i i could keep listening to you guys for another hour or two <laughs> but <clears throat> we'd like to open it up now for questions from the audience uh, you can either put your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand if you would prefer to ask your question verbally um, and i will begin with one for both of you um, Kevin, Ed's poetry influenced you so deeply when you were a young poet. Can you say something, both of you, about the importance of, of hearing, reading poetry from, you know, by people from your own, your own people, um, you know, as a way of influencing your own ability to write? That's kind of convoluted, but I hope you can see where I'm going with that. For sure, yeah, I would love to start. Um, I, I share about this in the the my story that I, I put into the anthology, but um, often felt like an isolated like being growing up. Um, I had my journals, I had my writing, but sort of just existed inside my head, um, writing about these things that meant a lot to me, writing about my family, and really thinking that no one else wanted to hear about my family or my experiences. Um, and then when I got a chance to meet other, well, when I, when I read Ed for the first time, it, it opened my eyes, um, the immediacy of it, the sharpness of it, 
um, the experiences of another Asian American. Um, it's one of the first times I ever read sort of the rawness of, of something like that, um, of those experiences of, mm-hmm. of, of a lot of things that I was dealing as an Asian American. Um, and that inspired me a lot. And then I got a chance to meet other people and sort of put me up and said, you know, like my story is is worth hearing. And there are other folks out there too who have stories that I really want to learn more from. Can Can you restate the question, Carolyn? I'm sorry. It's something about <laughs> the importance of, um, you know, hearing, reading, knowing there um, is poetry and writing from people in your own, you know, group, from Korean Americans, from Hmong writers. Yeah, I mean. Especially for a young writer coming, learning to, uh, you know, write. Yeah, so the first time I met Kevin was yesterday and we actually had a Zoom meeting to talk about what we're going to do and talk about today. And one thing that came up is the role of the writer um, as a possible, you know, topic. And we were talking um, and it seems to me like, first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to try to talk in like in the kind of big picture and then, and then answer in, in a more, um, focused way, hopefully. It seems to me like the question, what is the role of the writer is really dependent on the generation and the time and the maybe even the century and eon you're talking about, right? Um, Right now, I think the role of the writer, um, a role of the poet, let's say, um, no, the role of the poet is always the same. The role of the writer and it depends on the genre, like is to tell stories, right? But right now we're telling stories and Kevin is part of this. And, you know, I see Sun Young in the, in the audience and Katie, Leo, and, and, you know, so many other people who are storytellers telling stories from, from a marginalized perspective in, in this part of the century, I guess, new century of, of America and the world post pandemic, hopefully post pandemic, but, um, you know, and it's hard to be, we talked about how it, it's probably impossible to be a, a BIPOC writer writing about anything and it not being politicized mm-hmm. for better or for worse. You become a political writer, you know, if you're a BIPOC writer writing about anything, it's and then, you know, and how, like, of course, we all know now, you know, a white writer is also equally political and politicized now. There was a time in a generation, maybe a generation ago, or even maybe five years ago, depending on who and where you are, where right, white, right writers, writers were writing something universal and um, writers of color were all sort of journalists. And that was sort of the 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 mode of thinking in the publishing world in many sectors of society where um you know i guess the gates were closely guarded and now i think we see the gates opening and we see more stories and we see writers of color um doing or being seen in different ways through different frameworks um doing the same thing Mm -hmm. but um the frameworks have changed and so in this period in this moment it's sort of like anything that a writer of color is writing is relevant in a in a way maybe um i mean i think it's universal i think everything that a writer writes anytime in any eon is universal and that it's just sort of the framing of let's say the gatekeepers who then put labels on what is marginalized because you know Kevin's story and his family and anything he writes you know I use marginalized in quotes is like it what we're just people living and telling stories from our experience right 
And um, I don't know any writer, well, I can't speak for all writers, but I don't know any writer of color who goes around thinking, I'm a marginalized human being, I'm a marginalized human being. You know, most of the time people are just people, right? They're just writing their experiences. And I think it's a very good thing that these, um, these frameworks are becoming um, noticeable for their, um, I think, um, shallow framing and understanding of what readers are looking at when they're looking at a poem or a story by a writer of color. Okay. In terms of like community and lineage. So I think maybe, you know, when you think of the role of the writer or artist in prehistoric times, you know, they're writing petroglyphs on caves. That's what the poets are doing, right? Because there's no written language yet. They're drawing pictures. They're communing with, with the divine or the spirits or whatever. And that's why I think poets still do that. Um, but the lineage of like Asian American writers is very long. Um, and I, I would even, for me, it goes back beyond, um, in many ways beyond America because literature, like the Asian, the earliest Asian Americans were influenced by Chinese, Korean, Japanese literature, poetry, right? So that it's, so I see the, the writer as like this, um, unbounded by national boundaries and histories. It's this continuum and it's always telling stories and it's always communing with whatever the divine may be to that writer yeah. on some conscious or unconscious yeah. level. And there are just so many, like, you know, I named some who are here and like in the community and in the nation and in the world. And we're just all just kind of, you know, I think, if you just think of music, like poetry is, is a kind of kind of music, like we're all just dipping in and out of this milieu of, of poetry and words. And so every writer I've ever read has I'm sure influenced some molecule in my being. And I think um, that's the influence, like anything I've ever read that's sincere and that's speaking the truth. Okay, thank you. Speaking of Sun Young Shin, she has a question for you guys. Um, would both of you talk about more than a single story, what that means to you? Are there single stories that you feel press on your lives, your community's lives that you keep coming back to? It's a great question, Sun Young. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, uh, I know the process for it is... Um, I know, like, like, like you said earlier, Carolyn, I think reading Ed's story as the first chapter too, or, or, or the first story in there was, was extremely inspiring as a person who lived in South Minneapolis for a lot of my life um, in, in going through that. I think that in the midst of everything else that's going around, Sorry, my dog is losing her mind. Yeah. Ed, would you like to respond to that question? I think um, my mother is reading General Pumpkin to my daughter right now. Um, it's very loud out there. Um, okay. <clears throat> More than, a th are there stories? Are there narratives? Stories I keep coming back to um, I can't think of any one off the top of my head. I mean, I do think like the story of, you know, some an like ancestors, um, like apparently many generations ago. So I have this, um, given to me by my mom, this, this book, this chokpo, which is kind of like it records the lineage of you know all your grandparents 
grandfather, grandmother, so on and so forth down. Um, in more recent times, it included um, women, members of the family and sort of what they did and you know accomplishments or whatever, where they lived. And there's actually drawings of mountains and stuff and streams and rivers in Korea. And it, it goes back, um, this book, I just looked at it because I was showing my daughter, this goes back to the 1200s in Korea. And the first person in this, you know, or I guess the last person um, or the first person was this poet. And so there's a poem of his in this kind of family chronicle, this Chokpo. Um, and I do think of that, how, you know, what Kevin is doing is, and what we all are doing is, is like a, in, in, the, in the tradition of what other members of our family have done, storytelling, you know, Hmong tapestries, um, pottery, you know, however that artist is telling their story of their life and times and, and the influence of their family and community and village and country, war or otherwise. We're just participating in that. And so I do think of that, you know, that first poet um, who was at the time um, like a poet in the, in the royal court, but then because of political turmoil, um, went into exile um, and just lived in the mountains writing poetry, um, sort of disgusted with the petty, you know, wars and infighting of the royal families and so on. And so that, you know, that's one. Um, there's, you know, I'm sure other stories I could think of um, if I had more time. Okay. Um, sorry, my, I, I, I'm sorry. I, sorry, my dog was going wild, but um, I would love to give a full answer. Sorry, I misread the question. Mm -hmm. um, and such a great question too. Um, I think I, I shared a little bit about this at, at, at another um, mm -hmm. another panel, but I think one story that often comes up for me is um, whenever I read about Hmong people, whether it's on the news or in an article, there's often like one paragraph that tries to go over the the years of conflict in Southeast Asia um, briefly. And whenever Hmong people are mentioned, they always give that paragraph of Hmong people were um, soldiers in the secret war um, fighting against um, communism. And there's always that one paragraph that tries to sum up that entire history. And I think that's one single story that comes up over and over again. Um, and I think I'm really inspired, um, especially if the elders who are able to talk about what it meant to exist in that part of the world outside of the context of war, of what life was like before that, um, detaching itself from, from conflict and war, as important as that history is. Um, that's something that I've been finding really, really fascinating is moving beyond just this dichotomy and the shadow of war um, whenever I think about our people's history and our people's stories. Um, so I think that's one thing that I'm very, very fascinated about right now. Mm -hmm. outside. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah, to piggyback off that, I think about the, the effect of the Korean War on my parents' generation and the Japanese colonization. I mean, my parents were both born into a Korea that was colonized um, by Japan. And, you know, my father was given a Japanese name in Korea and forced to speak oh. Japanese and only learn Japanese. That, that's his childhood when he's, he was six years old, you know, my daughter's age right now. And one thing I've been talking about with my daughter a lot is, is um, cause she's kind of starting to read and, you know, write and, and sees me writing poems and is writing poetry and um, is also, you know, doing, doing many things. But so this, this figure, uh, Mogan Isak, that I re referred to, this poet, like rose out of nothing um, from a very poor family, um, just writing and um, studying. And he, he was able to pass this, this civil service, the civil service servant exam. And that's how he came to be placed in the court. Um, and so one thing that I, 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 that story, I guess it, it came up recently with my daughter because like, it's very important um, 
I think that she experiences um, uh, and it's a it's a great privilege, but that she can experience like different different types of ways of living, right? Different languages, different cultures. And being biracial, she's, you know, it's it's she's gonna gonna have to, you know, wrestle with that. Um and yeah, so she like she was it's such a I, I'm trying to be cognizant of time here. Um, but the importance of being able to see like the world from many different points of view, um, not just your families, not just your classes, not just your races, you know, particular point of view. Um, and that there are many, there's one truth, but there are many perspectives to that truth. And often those perspectives to that one truth are very different and and maybe don't even comprehend one another. And that that's very important. And so I think about that a lot in relation to how I think about my parents and you know the colonization and um, then the Korean War and what that did to like my family's trajectory. Like I was, you know, we I was ta I did a talk with David Murrah um, recently, and and these these things came up, and you know he said something to the effect of he was asked once or he asked his grandfather who was interned in the Japanese as a Japanese American um, was interned in the camps around World War II what would have happened if you wouldn't have because they lost everything they had some, uh, some sort of business um, and they lost everything and and it was just all taken and and had to start over after the war ended and they were released. And he asked his grandfather, who's, you know, in his nineties now, or his father, I'm sorry, David asked his father, what, what would have happened to our family? And his father said, we would have been rich. You know, his grandmother had just um, brokered a deal or a contract for like with some company or I, I, I don't want to, but they, they had everything in place so that their business was about to expand exponentially and all that was and so like this this affects um wars and and of course there's the, there's always the reverse you know who benefited who inherited all those farms that were abandoned or taken from the japanese americans like who inherited their businesses that they had built up with blood sweat and tears you know it was it was other americans of many different backgrounds and ethnicities and like these are the invisible histories and I'm, I'm very interested in how the fate of people individuals and collectively are abruptly altered oh my goodness that's this whole conversation has just been so beautiful and eye-opening but i'm afraid we're going to have to stop now we really appreciate your being here tonight Ed and Kevin, it was just a gorgeous discussion. We will then say good night and Thank hope you. to see everyone soon. All right. Good night. Good night, everyone.